Hi, and welcome to Going Native, a non-developer's tale. My name is Evgeny Smirnov, and I will take you on a journey to the fringes of PowerShell and beyond. A big shout out to our awesome sponsors who made this event possible with or without COVID-19. Today, we'll visit the outer limits of PowerShell and look over the edge. We'll start uh, with a refresher on using .NET code in PowerShell scripts, and then we'll get to the interesting part, tapping into the power of unmanaged code of Win32 APIs uh, for uh, our PowerShell code. Why should we want to extend the functionality of PowerShell? There are commands that just do not exist in PowerShell as we know it. Cert util, qwin station, and so on, they have no PowerShell equivalent. Sometimes the interoperability is an issue. I have an automatable application, but it was designed to be automated by native means, not by PowerShell, so the vendor does not provide a PowerShell module. Performance. Some of the uh, native types and uh, methods perform uh, significantly better than the PowerShell uh, commandlets. I'm, I've talked about that in my other talk this year. Most of the stuff I will be showing you today will appear trivial to a dev because it is trivial to a dev. But we're going to look at that stuff from a enterprise scripter perspective, not from the developer perspective. So I think um, <clears throat> if you're in the same boat uh, as myself, uh, being an enterprise scripter, not a programmer, I think you might find this useful. In breaking out of PowerShell, there are always three major challenges. Figuring out how to embed and execute the lower level code, figuring out how to pass the parameters to that code and retrieve some data back. And of course, handling errors should uh, errors arise, which they usually do. Embedding .NET code in PowerShell is easy because there is a certain relationship between the two. And indeed, in our daily PowerShell work, we're using .NET constructs without actually thinking for a second about it. Here's some examples of accidental .NET and PowerShell calling uh, static methods of types, accessing static properties of types, using .NET namespaces and types that just do their thing better than their PowerShell counterparts. And of course, if we apply a purist view to PowerShell coding, then Calling, dot calling uh, methods of objects is also not quite uh, monad shell compatible because a monad shell would have a commandlet for that. But let's leave the purest view and the philosophy aside and look at uh, intentional.net in PowerShell. If we want to embed .NET code which is objects, classes, namespaces, methods. We do exactly the same set of things we do in our accidental .netting in PowerShell. We invoke static methods, we access static uh, uh, properties, or invoke objects uh, methods and access uh, those properties. The only thing to keep in mind is in .NET, and in this talk, I will use .NET and c -sharp as synonyms, which is not entirely correct. But in talking about .NET code, I will always mean c -sharp code. Uh, .NET has a, a Visual Basic variety, so uh, we will not cover that, because c -sharp is what's closest to PowerShell, and uh, we, uh, we uh, stay with that. 
You always need a class to start from in C Sharp or in .NET for that matter. That's the only thing you need to keep in mind. And if you got weird errors, just look, uh, am I dealing with a class? And often enough, the answer is right there. So if you have a chunk of C-sharp code you'd like to reuse in your PowerShell script, you found something on Stack Overflow or wherever, um, just make sure it's wrapped into a class and then you can add type that class to your PowerShell code. Let's look at some code. I defined a simple .NET class. You can say at once I'm a cat person. A public class called dog, which we can instantiate without any parameters. And then the dog will be named Snoopy. Or we can give our dog a name at birth and then it will uh, uh, it will be named by then, be called by that name. Name is a public property which is gettable and settable, so we can rename our dog if, for instance, we found one on the street. Um, any object in .NET need an, a to string implementation, and uh, for the sake of this exercise, we override this uh, implementation and have the object output its name. We can have our dog say its name to us framed by some text and we can define a public static method bark so we can issue a bark without actually uh, instantiating a dog. So this this part of the script is a here string. It's a chunk of text, nothing more. Right? And to add this class to our PowerShell session, I just say add type, type definition. I had a class wrapped around my dog. Uh, uh, methods and properties and pass through so that it does get ended to a variable. Happy days! So let's look at what the type we just created in PowerShell looks like. It's named dog. It has a complete .NET assembly qualified name with version and culture. And it has a DLL name attached to that. Don't get high hopes. Uh, the DLL is entirely virtual. It only exists in memory. You will not find it on the disk and in this example. You could achieve the same result by doing just add type type definition dot net class you wouldn't have uh, needed pass through if you don't uh, put the variable at the beginning by the way so now let's make a new dog so the dog was called snoopy which is here we rename the dog in Rex and we have it bark its name, which is correctly Rex. We can instantiate Lassie with a name. My other dog is called Lassie and it says that if I use my uh, overridden to string implementation. We can also new an explicit constructor as a static method to construct, construct a Caesar dog and we can have it bark 
by either calling uh, the method from the type or from the variable that contains that type. Okay, basic stuff. If we need to add several classes to our PowerShell, we can keep them together visually. If you add built-in classes like array types, you know that chains of namespace parts that lead to fully qualified type name. System, collections, generic, hash set. System, collections, array list, and so on. We can do that here. Let's look at some code. Now I define two classes, a dog class similar to, uh, to the first, but embedded in a namespace pet, pets, and a cat class. It has similar uh, methods and properties. It meows instead of barking, but apart from that, it's uh, the same thing. And it's also embedded in that namespace. And then I add both of those uh, types or classes to my PowerShell. Nothing happens because I just added the classes. But if I try to create a pet out of the namespace pets, I have a choice between a cat and a dog. And if I choose to create a dog, I can make it bark. And if I choose to create a cat, I cannot make it bark, but I can make it meow. Happy days. But what if I only had a single method, a single function that I found on Stack Overflow and uh, I like to embed in my PowerShell. Do I need to uh, create a class and describe all the constructors and all, all this stuff? No, turns out I don't. Let's look at some code. I have a function that returns a string. I wasn't creative, so this function is called bark. And it, of course it doesn't return, return anything with a name in it because it, there is no object behind it. And I can add it not as a class definition, but as a member definition and have add type define the class and the namespace implicitly implicitly after doing this i can call the bark method of this type in this namespace as a static method and it will and it will work here you go happy days so this is how you embed a standalone function in your uh, PowerShell. An important thing, if you add a type definition from code, from a string within your script or uh, read from a text file to your PowerShell session, which in .NET will translate to an app domain, you can't add unadd or override it. So if you try to add the same clause multiple times, you will get an error. In the first uh, instance that you added remains in place. You need to keep an eye out of that uh, for that if you use that in dot source scripts, right? The cool thing about embedding C sharp code into PowerShell is that it works on PowerShell 4, PowerShell 3, and I think 
even on PowerShell 2. So if you need backward compatibility, but if you like programming in classes, that's the way to go. You can write your classes. I mean, C Sharp classes do not uh, look all that different from PowerShell classes. So you can, you can do that easily and it works all the way back to at least PowerShell 3.0. We saw a DLL at the bottom of our PowerShell ty uh, .NET type that we added into our PowerShell session. What if we have a DLL already because it was contained in the operating system or some application? Then you have an assembly and you can add that assembly to your PowerShell code. You don't need any magic there. You just use add type or some other means we'll talk about in a second to add that and use the objects and namespaces from that assembly in your PowerShell code. For the demonstration, I chose SQLite, a really nifty small library, free to use for everybody and add it to a .NET or PowerShell project. It delivers an object model very similar to that of Microsoft SQL. So if you have experience in uh, programming Microsoft SQL objects, at least uh, as far as querying and retrieving data is concerned, um, you can reuse that in uh, SQLite quite easily and uh, use, use that for your local uh, data storage for your, uh, for your scripts without having to resort to a uh, SQL server. Let's have a look. I brought the library with me, so it resides in the sa uh, same uh, directory as the script. And I add type it with the parameter path it loads the assembly and, and then uh, we can use those objects. System data SQLite. You don't need see that namespace unless you add that library. Another way to load the LL is by using reflection. Reflection assembly namespace and then a static meta load file. It's roughly equivalent to add type minus path, but there are minor differences for non-developers. It's the same thing. You can add uh, some error handling to add, uh, add type and some other uh, nifty stuff that uh, you couldn't add here. For those of you and for, uh, given the intended audience of this talk, that should be everybody who get their .NET from Stack Overflow. <laughs> uh, you will find code snippets where load with partial name is used for those assemblies that are part of Windows part of uh, presentation framework or management framework or whatever. You need to start reading this out of your scripts because this stuff is deprecated. You can add an assembly by assembly name. You don't need to know where it resides on the disk. But you do need the fully qualified name including version, culture, uh, and public token. With that knowledge, you can add a DLL registered on the system quite easily. Where do we do the? Uh, where do we get those uh, fully qualified name from? There are tools for that. If you have Visual Studio installed, gacutil slash l, it will list you all registered uh, registered DLLs or assemblies on your system. Or you just drop down into the registry, hkey classes root, 
uh, installer assembly is global and enumerate the values that are there. Those are the fully qualified name, names of assemblies registered on your Windows. Second part of embedding lower level code is passing data back and forth. PowerShell accept arguments by the value 99% of the time. You pass a set of arguments to function and you get some results back. Or you don't get any results back and the function does something in the rest of the environment. There is a possibility in PowerShell of passing data by reference to a function but it is not very widely used in pure PowerShell. In native.NET, passing data by reference is used, used much more widely. And let's have a look at that. I've brought an example of uh, doing this in pure PowerShell as well, but I, you, can, you can look at that. Grab, grab the sample code and just look at the script. But let's look at the method definition of the static method try pass of the built-in type int. It's a .NET type, it's, it's not a PowerShell type uh, in this sense. So uh, it takes two parameter in the simplest, uh, simplest version, a string that has to be passed and a reference to a variable that will receive the results of parsing, an integer number, if the parsing was successful. And the return value of the function is a boolean value, a true-false value, false value that indicates whether the parsing was successful or not. To use that, you need to pass your par second parameter by reference. So this will not be successful. You get an error which translated into English. Sorry, I, uh, I have a German operating system on here. Uh, it says, so in the error message, use the ref. Well, let's follow the guidance and use the ref. We initialize the variable as a ref to zero and then we receive a reference object that has a property named value. The value can be a complex object. It can be anything that PowerShell or .NET can process in, uh, in, in terms of object. But i itself is not 10. The property value of i is 10, right? And there I define some custom functions in .NET that use uh, the reference mechanism. You are free to play with them uh, yourself. There are two variants. Just grab the sample code and uh, look at that. Handling errors. PowerShell has the concept of terminating and non-terminating errors, right? Terminating errors are um, terminate the execution of the context they, are, uh, they uh, rise in and non-terminating error just output an error message uh, depending on how the uh, preferences are configured in your PowerShell session. In calling .NET methods from your PowerShell script it's slightly different. If you just let .NET errors happen, if your method that or your function that you defined in your .NET code or loaded from a library, if that raises an error, you will always be able to continue your PowerShell execution unless your uh, error action preferences are set to stop. But if they set to continue, you will always continue, it will, will always be treated as a non-terminating error. 
unless you put it into a try catch clause and tell PowerShell that you expect it to be terminating, then it behaves like it was terminating and actually terminates or triggers the try catch uh, try catch mechanism. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. If you don't catch the exception, the script will run through. If you catch them, any of them will be caught. I brought some sample code for you, but uh, I think we'll skip that. Grab the sample scripts and uh, look at the code. It's, it's uh, nothing more to it. Let's turn to the interesting stuff. Accessing native code. I will use three words as synonyms in this talk. In the rest of this talk, native code, unmanaged code, and Win32 code, they are, for the sake of this session, all the same uh, thing. So why do we need some inception levels to uh, access the unmanaged code? Or why do we need to access unmanaged code at all? There are things out there on your Windows system the, that uh, not only have no PowerShell equivalent, but they also don't have any .NET equivalent. Search Util or Regload or QWinster. If you need to access this functionality, you basically do one of the two things. You wrap PowerShell around the DOS command and deal with date formats, uh, Unicode, non-Unicode, line breaks, uh, error messages, all this kind of uh, all this kind of stuff that is not really PowerShell compatible. Or you have a look at the documentation, see what APIs. The tool of your choice is using and try to call them yourself. That's where you that's where you need to access unmanaged code. Most every Windows program that comes with Windows as a DOS uh, tool will access some APIs to execute its functions. And you can use them from PowerShell as well. Um, it's a two-step process. You need or two-level process. That uh, that's why I spoke about inception. You first need to embed a native call into .NET because .NET has that functionality. PowerShell doesn't have that functionality. And then, when your .NET or C# -sharp code is done, you put it into your PowerShell script, like we've seen before, and call it from there. Our own Matt Graber wrote a very nice three-part blog uh, entry on the Scripting Guys blogs seven years ago. We'll use that as a guiding line for our examples. To embed a Win32 API as a non-developer or probably as a developer for that matter. Maybe those guys and girls have tools I know nothing about. Uh, it doesn't matter. For a non-developer, it's a three-step process. You find a native function definition. This one you will always find in the vendor's documentation. For native code, if you don't have vendor's documentation for the function's definition, well, you're screwed because you can't read them back and you need some disassembly tools maybe uh, or something but it's 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 all uh, it's all very vague you you won't have uh, you won't achieve good results uh, by by guessing you need the native function definition if you have that and that's uh, precise 
and correct and up to date enough, there is usually a way to bring that into your PowerShell script. Second, you find the platform invoke definition of that call. Platform invoke means it's a .NET term that means I call platform code, Win32 code in, in this case, from .NET. For the built-in stuff in Windows, pinvoke.net is a very good starting point. It's a wiki where community members have uh, put in pinvoke function definitions that uh, worked in, uh, in some manner. For third-party stuff, pinvoke is usually not going to help you because those guys concentrate on the Windows stuff. You need to either have the vendor supply the definition or you deduce the definition yourself. We'll see how it works in a minute. And then you just add type the definition, call the method and pray. Easy, right? In practice, it's not always that easy. The native definitions look or may look weird to PowerShell. -er. Boo, copy file, LPCT, STR, and so on. I mean, it looks like a function definition, all right, but where the function's body, right? It looks like it would uh, return a boolean result and take a boolean argument with what are what are those other guys. So it's it's not familiar to us us PowerShellers. If we understand how this stuff works, and I hope you will also do so in a minute, um, it becomes clearer. And then in the documentation. And that is a Microsoft API doc documentation that's got better over the years. Uh, it says if the function succeeds, the return value is non-zero. And if the function fails, the return value is zero. It said Boolean uh, in the definition, right? Okay. Uh, so let's let's read on. A quick search on pinvoke. There is a chapter on copy file, but it doesn't reference the copy file function. It references a, another function that actually does the same thing, but has uh, much more extended functionality. So not what we were looking for. Back to Google or back to Matt's blog, that definition actually works. And then there is something that not many PowerShellers who do uh, embed native code actually realize that's why I'll stress it here. Here is the actual p invoke definition taken from Matt's blog. And you see let me do a laser pointer here. You see we import a kernel 32 DLL and uh, invoke the function or uh, abstract the function copy file that has those parameters. We've seen them in the official documentation and then we add that as uh, a class uh, kernel32 and namespace win32. Only those two strings in this example that are marked yellow do actually relate to objects that are hard-coded. We need to know which DLL we uh, will be embedding or importing into our code, and we need to know how the entry point is called. The rest, you can call whatever you like. Let's look at some code. So here's the uh, Mets variant of, uh, of the p-invoke kernel 32 DLL, uh, copy file, three parameters and two strings, old path, new path or existing path and new path. And uh, if, if it should fail 
on uh, the target file existence. We add that uh, into our um, app domain and then uh, execute that. Nothing fancy here. Yeah, we used to have the test txt, then it got copied to uh, test 2 txt, then we deleted that and uh, <clears throat> it's a static method, so whichever way we call it, it, uh, it does its job. But, look at this. I'm still embedding this DLL. But I'd like my embedded function to be called bark bark. Yeah, oh, well, I'm a dog person, right? And it should bark from to, and uh, it should be possible to tell it to not bark on existing. I still need to specify the entry point because the kernel 32 DLL doesn't know uh, anything about barking or dogs. Um, but I can do that in the DLL import decorator. And then what I do here is entirely optional. I can use my class name. Let's see if it works because I've used it before. Uh, actually, that's, that's a nice demonstration. Uh, the top row are PowerShell PowerShell uh, tabs that are supposed to be uh, independent from each other in ES, uh, ISE. But if I do this, you see that the pets namespace I defined in a completely different uh, tab uh, exists in, in this tab as well. L let's run the code. Uh, Yeah, that's that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Let me open another instance of the ISE. Okay, so on and then this is the script. Happy days. It works like before, but I call bark bark instead of copy file and the type uh, highs. Uh, uh, is called pets.dog and not win32.kernel32 or whatever, right? Think about it. Because if names of arguments don't actually matter, then what matters in embedding unmanaged code? There is no argument binding in, in unmanaged code. What happens is this. Native code functions only accept arguments of a fixed length. So once the, the function is defined, it's known in advance how much memory is needed to accommodate all the arguments there are. And then the caller is required to pass exactly that amount of bytes to the function, it receives them and splits the bytes according to its internal definition in argument 1, argument 2, argument 3, and so on. Okay, so you could get by by passing one 64-bit integer where two 32-bit integers are required. You just need to get uh, your byte order right, and then it would be exactly the same thing as far as uh, uh, native code is concerned. That's unmanaged for you. 
Of course, for fixed length types like integers, floats, and uh, all those numeric types, charts, it's easy because they are fixed length and you can just uh, put, put them into, into the arguments and be done with it. Strings, arrays, data structures and whatever else of variable length need to be handled differently. And for that, uh, native codes works with pointers. That's what LP in those string names, uh, string argument names uh, means in the function definition. LP existing file name, long pointer to a string that will contain existing file name. So what happens is this, the caller allocates a chunk of memory as long as the string needs to be puts the string bytes in there, it's zero terminated, so the last byte is zero, and then it supplies the function with a pointer uh, to the place in memory where the be string begins. That's what happen happens under the hood. In importing a DLL in .NET, we put a process in place called marshalling that does all this referencing and dereferencing work for us. It works very well if we only need to pass string data to the function. You saw that in the uh, math uh, example, uh, we just passed two, uh, two uh, file paths to a function, so we just wrote a string uh, data type in the uh, .NET function definition and it was okay, the function worked. If we need to receive the data back, that's where it gets, uh, gets difficult because there is no knowing which, in which format the strings are returned by the function. Uh, I mean, there is knowing that but you need to read the documentation. You cannot uh, require that the function return a uh, Unicode. You can pass it a Unicode string as an argument to receive a value and it puts an ANSI value into that string because that's how it, uh, uh, what it was programmed to do, right? So marshalling and demarshalling that's a pro uh, process that happens, that usually happens automatically, but sometimes it needs to be enforced to achieve the, the type that you, ex you expect in your uh, C-sharp or PowerShell code. Putting it all together, let's look at some code. For this, I chose a nifty DLL from the Windows driver development kit called offline library uh, offline registry offline registry allows you to open the registry hive start somewhere on the disk and uh, navigate or even alter its internal structures without actually importing that in the registry. It's a, it's a very nifty function, uh, fast, and it has three main advantages. It does not, contrary to reg load, expose the loaded hive to the rest of your Windows machine. Only the process that calls those methods uh, is able to access the file. It completely disrespects security descriptors. You can read and you can even alter the registry structure inside the hive, even if in real life your uh, account wouldn't have had any access there, but you do have read or write access to the file. And um, uh, you, can, you can also access uh, a registry file that is loaded, except uh, at least for reading. So, a very nifty function. 
uh, or library of functions, but there is no .NET implementation for that. This is driver developer kit, and uh, so those are uh, those are uh, all C++ functions. In my professional life, I do migrations and migrating thousands of user profiles, you need to access their uh, registry hives. And it's usually a pain in the ass. But with this library, you can streamline this process. Some of the pain remains, but it, uh, it uh, really gets better. The library is free for everyone who is prepared to download 12 gigs uh, worth of ISO. For the driver developers uh, development kit, I included that in the demo code. Um, there are two variants for 64 and uh, 86 uh, and 64-bit uh, uh, and 32-bit. Uh, uh, and uh, there are some functions we want to look at today. What we want to do is simply enumerate subkeys uh, under a under the root of the hive. For this, we need to open the hive. What it does is this. Let's let's try to translate this definition. It takes a single argument, the hive path. It's a pointer to a wide string, which is a Unicode string. And it expects a variable where there will be a pointer to a handle to the root key of the hive. A handle is some arcane object stored somewhere in memory and the variable ph key result after the function was successful, we'll have a pointer to that area in memory. So let's do this. Public static extern integer. Yeah, we're outputting a D word, which is an integer. Open hive. It will take a path. It's in, so we doesn't need to worry about marshalling. And it will output an internal pointer to our root key handle. What we do with that, the documentation states very clearly. If the function succeeds, the return value is error success, which is zero, and uh, otherwise it's not zero. So we need to call that after we've done, we're done. We need, of course, cl to close the hive. Or those handles <coughs> are uh, remain in the memory and represent a, what is called a memory leak. So it takes the root key handle that we've got here and just closes or removes the reference to that object and uh, marks the memory as free. Easy as that. Now, we'd like to know how many subkeys are in there and enumerate them. This is a weird one. It takes a handle to a key for the root key, it takes the root key handle. For a sub key, it takes a sub key handle. And then we've got some parameters, most of them pointers to D words. <coughs> and one is a pointer to file time, which is a long integer. Those are all optional. Optional in this context does not mean that you can omit them in your uh, p-invoke definition. You need to include them into the definition, but it's basically, but it basically doesn't matter what you put in there as long as you don't expect 
to uh, to get um, uh, sensible results back. This is a weird one. It's a pointer to a string accompanied by a <coughs> pointer to a <coughs> to an integer variable that uh, contains the number of characters in that string. Let's look at pinvoke. <clears throat> Key handle. And that's what you do if you have a string to get back. You can not just write string or ref string. It usually won't work. But if you do a string builder, you don't even uh, need to specify uh, the ref for out variable it, it it will work it will work as is, uh, as in uh, intended so the class length that is this guy here it was specified as in out which is ref ref is in or out and all the rest was out uint those guys are all pointers but they will be marshaled back to uint, or in this case, to long. Okay? That's how it works. And the only thing we're, in, thing we, we're interested in here is num keys. And once we've got the number of sub keys in this guy, we can call enum key subsequently increasing the index from 0 to number of keys minus 1. And then we got some nifty information like the name uh, or the class and the last write time of that key. I've included two more methods but will not be using them, open key and close key. We'll be using them in the next example. So what we then do is add the member definition of uh, the pinvoke to our to our uh, PowerShell, I chose the class name offline registry in the namespace Windows DDK. But as you know, those names could have been Dog and Snoopy. <clears throat> and then I open the Hive. I look if the Hive open results were was zero, and if it was. I should have a, some legible value in a root k handle pointer. And if that's the case, I just query the info on that root key. I need a string builder because I expect to get the string builder back, so I need to pass the variable of the string builder class by reference. What I put into class len, it should be one. That's reading the documentation. It should be, or it must be the length of the string in the string builder containing the terminating zero character. So I don't have any any string uh, characters in the new class. So the the only character is the terminating zero character. So that's why I put one in here. Then I initialize all those <coughs> variables. It's all PowerShell here, by the way. We're out of .NET or C sharp. And then I query the info key with those parameters and look at the result. And if that was zero, I should know how many sub keys and values I have in that key and uh, when it was last written. And then can I, I can enumerate those keys. Let's have a look. That's exactly what's happening. Hive is op open in, opened and has a handle. It's just an address in memory. And if I, if I were to change this value before passing it to a subsequent function call, I would probably get an access violation because 
it's an address in memory and the operating system knows at that other address my PowerShell process has no business snooping around. So query info key uh, returns zero. All is well. I've got 10 sub keys and zero values, which is what I would expect in the root key. And last write was this guy, and this was somewhere in, in the mid of April 2020, which is quite plausible uh, considering where I've got that anti-user dot from. Subkeys are app events, console, control panel, environment, EUDC, keyboard layout, network, printers, software, system. All the 10 of them and that's basically what you'd expect to see in the root key of uh, <coughs> of the user registry of the pretty much um, uh, vanilla user. Now you would say that this is ugly code and that's true. As PowerShell, you'd like PowerShell, you don't want want to keep track of all those uh, handles and pointers to handles and string builders and so on. So what do we do here? We wrap the calls to the native functions into a PowerShell function. Let's have a function that enumerates subkeys of a arbitrary key. It takes two argument, arguments, hive path to the file where the hive is stored, and the key, which is backslash, uh, backslash uh, separated, like a, it, uh, it's usual in the register business. Look if, if the file is there. And then for the key tree, we look, open the hive, and iterate through through the key levels. And in this function, we do all these calls and evaluate the results. And when we don't find a particular key, then the key uh, and the key is not found. Uh, and if if we find all the key tree, then we do an enumeration of the keys like we did before. But of course, but of course, uh, we don't output just the names. We are PowerShellers here, so we output complex objects that contain <coughs> that kind of information that we can get uh, get from here. Let me see, here we go. So we defined a subkey as name, path to, to that, including the complete path in last write. That's, that's all we get from, from those other uh, native code calls. And let's <clears throat> look at how it work. oh, works. Okay, the type name, Windows DDK offline registry is already uh, been defined, which is not a problem here because we do not need to redefine the uh, native code calls. So we can just uh, define our function and then call it. Get offline registry subkeys hive path would be um, <clears throat> demos int user dat and 
and the key okay i specified the key as uh, uh, mandatory so if if i'd like to see the contents of the root key i do this And rather unsurprisingly, I get these 10 friends. But if I say I would like to know what's on the software, here it is. And if you, if you like seeing what's happening under the hood, you just call it with verbus and you see all those operations handles and keys that's all there is to it for today folks knowing how the access to memory is handled is the key if you're stuck or is the key to embedding native code into your powershell uh, scripts watch out for strings encodings and so on is something native code knows significantly less about than your PowerShell or c -sharp code. Read up on data structures. I haven't touched the, those, but they are very, very widely used throughout the native API of w whatever application. Start thinking in modules, because if you write functions like those, that last function I showed you, you're one step away from writing a module, publish it for the community on the gallery or in your blog or on GitHub. Uh, do everybody a favor, incorporate even more native APIs in PowerShell modules. I'm not a dev, but I usually keep a working Visual Studio install handy. Because if you're stuck, and your native code throws weird errors and you coded yourself into a corner and do, know, <clears throat> do not know what, what's going on. It really helps to eliminate one level of inception to whip up a simple console application in C Sharp. You don't need to know much C Sharp to do that. Not more than you need to embed C Sharp into PowerShell, in fact. And just have the original, original errors, original access violations or whatever violations happen there output to your console. Community Edition is enough. It has all the uh, simple uh, projects that you need to get it working. You find all the demo codes and the slides of this presentation on GitHub, PSConf EU 2020. Here's a nice QR code for you. It has not been generated by PowerShell, by the way. It was generated using a free service on the internet. But nevertheless, it will take you to a small website where you can find all that information in clickable form. <clears throat> Hit me up if you have any questions. And hopefully see everybody in good health next year, June 1 to 4 in Hanover at the PowerShell Conference Europe 2021. Thank you very much.